Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kevin Rockwell with Webtoberfest and I want to welcome you to a special uh, interview we're going to do with our a very special guest from Bamberg, Germany. Uh, Matthias Trum is the brewmaster of Schlenkerla and Matthias can you tell us a bit about what you do and what, what, uh, what your brewery is all about? Uh, Kevin, thanks so, uh, thanks so much for inviting me to this special event. And uh, even though Oktoberfest is more a Munich kind of thing, um, I'm very happy that we here from Bamberg can participate in that event uh, in, in the United States. And um, uh, what I wanted to add to what you said about the introduction about myself, I'm not only the brewmaster, um, but I own, uh, also own the Schlenkerwald Tavern in the sixth family generation together with my father. Um, so we have a long, long standing family history and the seventh generation is under and um, the special thing about Schlenkela, and I guess that's most what we talk about today is uh, the smoke beer. The, uh, uh, the specialty of, of Schlenkela is that we're not only uh, a brewery, but we're also malting operations. So um, we do the malt ourselves and that's where the smokiness gets into the beer. Um, but before we talk too much, uh, I would say we start with the beer. It's uh, for you guys, it's in the morning, uh, I gathered. So that's a perfect day at time to start with the Frühschoppen, as we call it in Bavaria, um, which is the morning pint. And my suggestion would be to start with the Schlenkerle Pay Lager um, that's available in the United States as well, uh, both in bottles and in cans. Our US importer has a canning. Uh, operation where he brings in beer in tank containers for maximum freshness and cans that. So um, the pay lager is available in both um, um, uh, vessels, if you will. Uh, the specialty be, uh, about the Schlenkel pay lager is that it's actually not brewed with a smoked malt, but um, it's fermented with a yeast that was in the classic smoked beer before. So um, the yeast transports some of the smokiness from the smoked beer into the pay lager. And therefore the pale lager is a perfect introduction to the style. So for all of the uh, viewers, all of you out there who have never had a smoked beer before, um, the pale lager would be the one you want to start with. I remember when we were in, in, uh, in Bombert there and, and you told us about the, the smoked beer and how the first sip is not the, uh, it's the second sip that where you start to understand maybe. Mm -hmm. Is it, is it similar with this beer or is it a much lighter type of effect with this, the pellet? No, that's much lighter. Here, um, some people actually describe that as a homeopathic smoke beer because it's so subtle and so in, in the background. Um, technically, you, uh, you're not allowed to call it a smoke beer because it does not contain smoke malt. Like smoke beers have to contain smoke malt. But um, the yeast brings a real nice smoky, smoky tone to it. And if you never had a smoke beer before, um, you will notice a defined smokiness in that one. A little bit maybe like in the Scottish whiskeys that get a little bit of smokiness. From okay. That. So, cheers. Cheers. Hi. My evening, your morning. <laughs> As you can see, it's a classic pale lager, like the typical Munich lager beers from, say, Augustine or uh, Hakapshor. Um, but it has a little bit more of a golden color to it and this really nice smooth uh, smokiness uh, in, in, in the background flavor. And how, um, how long have you been making that one? When we have, um, there's an interesting story to this one actually. I mean the, the smoke beer is the classic beer and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the smoke beer history later on. This one was actually introduced in the 1920s. Um, after World War I, uh, there was a big economic uh, decline in Germany, obviously, and later on the Great Depression that also came to the United States also, of course, hit Germany. And uh, my great-grandfather in the 1920s got a contract to supply the Bamberg train station with beer. Um, normally, he wouldn't have accepted that because we concentrated on our own tavern, but apparently uh, economic times were so dire that he was forced to accept that contract. And they took the normal smoke beer, but in addition, they wanted a non-smoky beer as well. And so he, he introduced the pale lager. And ever since then, it uh, became something of a secret tip here in town. Um, a lot of craftsmen prefer that one and uh, because it's not as, uh, it doesn't have as much alcohol as a classic smoke beer. Mm -hmm. This one comes at 
and three, whereas the classic smoked beer comes at 5.1. And so it's a really nice, uh, easy drinking beer, uh, a thirst quencher, if you will. And a lot of craft people here in, in, in Bamberg drink that. So cheers to that. Well, when we were in Bamberg last, last year and it was 100 degrees <laughs> Fahrenheit, that was the perfect beer for that kind of weather. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We, we actually have something which you can't get in the, in the United States, but as we're talking about it, I want to water your mouth a little bit. Um, this is actually a blend of the Pay Lager and the classic Merzenrauch beer, the Kreuzen style, which is a summertime beer which we offer here. So it brings the best of both worlds. And uh, whenever you're back in, in Bamberg in the summertime, I'm going to get you a bottle of these ones here. So that's a nice combination of it. So, so yeah. Bamberg, Bamberg um, with, with regard to Americans, kind of got on the map because of the GIs that were stationed there during World War II at the base. And, and they're right. you know, getting to know your beer and then like bringing that, that taste sensation home or that feeling, oh, I, I had this, this beer that was so different. Um, do you do you see that a lot in the people that the, the tourists that come to your your brewery? That sort um, of uh, my dad told me about sort of thing. Definitely, I see I see that a lot in emails. Actually, um, our U.S. importers started bringing Schlenker over to the United States in the mid 1990s, and in the last five or ten years, uh, the range has increased considerably. So nowadays, we're available in most states. And uh, very often I get emails from former uh, station soldiers here in, in Bamberg that found a bottle of Schlenkeler somewhere in the local uh, specialty craft beer store. And as soon as they open the bottle and they drink uh, uh, the, uh, the Schlenkeler smoked beer, they're immediately teleported back to that time. Um, the way our brain works is we associate uh, uh, smells, we associate flavors with certain experiences from our youth or when we were younger in general. And when you get a particular flavor, which you only had in one location, some at some times during, uh, during your past, it will always, uh, always bring you back to that. But the smells you associate with certain travels like in Indian uh, spices or um, um, uh, the, the wilderness in, in, in some countries. Smoked beer is an acquired taste. And not everybody will like it, definitely not. And uh, there is no middle way. Either you love it or you hate it, but you will remember no matter what. <laughs> uh, just to divert a little bit, tell us a little bit about Bomberg. Where is Bomberg in Germany for those who might not know? And, and what is its relationship to the other other Okay, so Bamberg uh, is, is uh, situated in Bavaria, which is um, a state of Germany. So Germany is a federal state, just like the United States, and Bavaria is one of those states. The capital of Bavaria is Munich, where the actual Oktoberfest happens, and Munich beer, of course, is uh, quite famous. Uh, Munich is relatively in the south of, of Bavaria. Um, Bamberg, however, is up in the north, and the northern half of Bavaria is actually called Franconia. Um, Franconia used to be independent, uh, became part of Bavaria some 200 years ago in the Napoleonic Wars. So a little bit similar than Sc uh, like Scotland and England. Like Scotland, and, Scotland is part of the UK today, but a Scottish person would never consider itself to be English. Yeah? And the same is here in Bavaria. Franconian would never consider itself to be a Bavarian, but from a political point of view, we are Bavarian. And um, on, on the beer side, of course, we profit from that uh, reputation. What most people don't know is that um, about half of the breweries of Bavaria are actually in Franconia. So um, there's more beer diversity in Franconia than in Bavaria, uh, but the big exporting, uh, exporting breweries from Bavaria, which you know worldwide, Löwenbrau, uh, Hofbrauhaus and so forth, these are all Bavarian uh, breweries. So when, when you travel uh, the Fr Fr Franconia, Franconian countryside, it's a little bit like a time travel, especially Bamberg. Uh, Bamberg is UNESCO World Heritage Town uh, since 1993. We have the largest intact inner uh, city quarter in all of Germany because there was no bombing here in World War II. There's more than 2,000 protected uh, buildings in town, Schlenkeler being one of them very much medieval influence. You have a lot of half timbered building, a beautiful large cathedral, um, a, a King Bishop's residency, 
a lot of museums, um, a very beautiful town hall, which is in, in the middle of the river actually. So um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bridge town hall with beautiful uh, Baroque paintings on it. So um, it's, it's really like a, a, a museum, the entire town. And um, because of that, we're nowadays attracting a lot of travelers. Uh, this year with Corona, obviously, mainly Germans and Europeans, but um, I guess once this whole craziness is over, um, travel will commence from other parts of the world as well. So a lot of Americans are coming here. So we'll really touch on that. I mean, since we're talking about having this, this virtual Webtoberfest because of Corona, because of all the, uh, the pandemic worldwide, it's got to be affecting, well, obviously it's shut down Oktoberfest in Munich, it's shut down all the Oktoberfest uh, here in, in the States, and we're trying to bring some joy and uh, celebration to folks who at home with, with Webtoberfest. But what, it, what have the impact have you seen in, in, uh, in terms of that? And you obviously a lot less people coming, but uh, how, are, how are your business and other businesses coping with the pandemic? Well, um, all the big festivals were canceled here as well. Oktoberfest is only in Munich in Germany. Um, uh, all the other towns have their own festivals. Here in Bamberg, it's called Sandkava and it's the end of August. And that one was canceled, of course. So um, uh, gastronomy is really very much struggling. Um, in, in the lockdown here in Germany, we had a, a, a nationwide lockdown from mid-March to about mid-May. And only since end May, taverns were allowed to reopen. And we have to keep uh, distances between the tables. So you only have about half the seats, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's very similar to the States, I suppose. And um, it's a big uh, strain on, on, on gastronomy and taverns. The summertime actually worked halfway decent because um, the, uh, the, the government and the city, they were very lenient in uh, giving taverns the option to put on, to put out additional chairs uh, in, in the street, additional tables, car, car parking was taken away uh, in order to enable taverns to have larger beer gardens. Um, in our case, for instance, we were able to double the size of our beer garden on the weekends at least, um, thereby coming back to the original seating. So uh, we managed okay in the summertime um, but the big question is what's going to happen in wintertime yeah? when, when you don't have outdoor seating, like we cannot put up a tent outside because it's a, a, a frequented street where cars have to pass through. So that's going to be, be a tough one. Um, Germany has a relatively good uh, system regarding labor, uh, which is called short labor. So um, basically, um, I can keep all my staff employed as if there was no Corona and whatever <laughs> hours they do not work, they get paid for by the government, not in full, but they get about 60, 70 uh, percent. Uh, it increases over the month from their original wages. So everybody more or less gets gets by, but uh, of course you have your uh, fixed costs, which you cannot reduce, like uh, um, um, rent you have to pay or maintenance on machinery in that. So it's, it's not gonna be a good, good year. And the same for the breweries. Um, the breweries uh, which have a large percentage of sales in taverns, they're struggling because obviously with, the, uh, with all those regulations, um, being out with friends drinking is not as much fun. So you don't drink as much or you don't drink at all. Um, but home consumption has increased considerably. And the supermarket sales have gone up so all the breweries that say, sell a lot in, in uh, supermarkets, they're actually doing okay. So um, um, it, it, it's, the, the big question is going to be the winter. So um, I guess some taverns will close down. Not everybody is going to reopen or not on the same management, to put it that way. Uh, but um, well, I, I can remember being there in the summertime when... Uh, your tavern was was bustling, full of people indoors, and then a uh, hundred a hundred people or more out of the street, just having a beer in the street with friends. And it was a wonderful environment. Uh, it just seemed so cordial, and uh, everybody hanging out and and having good good uh, food and good good beer. Can can you go over some about the uh, malting process that that creates the the Rausch beer? Yeah, sure. Um, I, um, I would suggest that we show some images for that. Sure. 
the specialty I said about Schwenkala is that we have our own malting operation. And when you look at the principles of, of uh, malt making, um, the first step is that we get barley from local farmers and um, we uh, put that into uh, uh, what is called a steep. You can imagine that like um, a swimming pool with water inside and then you put the barley inside and the barley soaks in water and then it comes to germination boxes. That's the image you see here. Mm -hmm. um, and like a big basin where you have a lot of uh, barley inside and the barley starts to sprout. When, when, we look, when we look inside here in the image and you see that the little seedlings are coming out uh, of, of the barley. Um, and this sprouting is going on for about one week and then the barley needs to be dried. Um, in the uh, malt maltsters or brewers language, this is called kilning. So this basic principle is the same in all malt houses. The difference at Schlenkele is how we kiln the malt. Um, we use uh, beech wood from, from local forests. So um, these are beech wood logs. Um, we cut down beech wood or we get beech wood from uh, local forests to the west of Bamberg is the largest beech wood forest in all of Germany. And this is stored for about three years until it is really, really dry. And then we make a fire with that beech wood. You can imagine that similar to, to your uh, uh, chimney at home when you have your, your evening uh, fireplace and you make it warm in, in, your, uh, in your home. And the heat from that fire directly kills the malt. Um, we have here, you can see this image. So on, on the left hand here, you see the, um, the, the actual fireplace of the kiln. And this is one of our employees and he puts in these meter long uh, beechwood logs and the actual grain is stored up here. Um, I have a schematics, an old one. Here you can see the principle. This is actually a sketch which is more than 200 years old um, from, uh, from France actually. And here you can see in the middle of the image um, the, uh, the place where uh, the, the beechwood logs are put inside. And then you have like a, a little umbrella up here. Uh, the function is that it distributes the smoke and the heat so that the heat goes uh, evenly uh, to the top here and uh, dries the mold in, a, in a, a homogenic way like that it gets dry at the same time everywhere and that it's not burnt in the middle while it is still wet on the outer parts. And the, the important part is that the malt is dried directly, meaning uh, the heat and the exhaust, uh, the, the smoke from the fire, go into the malt and give it its specific aroma and flavor. In all modern malt houses, you have heat exchanging units similar to your home heating system where you have um, a, an oil engine or a gas engine. Um, and obviously it, you don't want the smoke from oil or gas fire in, in your malt because that's going to give it a, a bad flavor. So they have a heat exchanging system which filters out the smoke first and with the secondary air, which is aroma free, they do the actual kilning process. And okay, so um, <clears throat> that's, that's the, the, the specialty of Schlenkela that we do this direct kilning process. Now, the interesting question is um, how that was invented or how it came into existence. Now, um, when, when you do a city tour in Bamberg, um, uh, a sightseeing tour with the Bamberg uh, tourist guides, quite often they tell you the story that at some point in the Middle Ages, the Schlenkerle brewery burned down and uh, the malt got smoked by accident. And uh, because <laughs> The brewer uh, couldn't afford to throw out the malt. He had to make a beer from that. And for some weird reason, the Bamberg people liked the flavor. And ever since then, um, they were brewing beer all, all the time the same way. Um, it's a nice anecdote, but it's very far from the truth. Uh, truth is actually, uh, beer has been around for uh, more than 10,000 years. It's the oldest 
nourishment of mankind next to bread, beer and bread was the uh, early nourishment of the early high cultures in Mesopotamia, uh, Babylonians, Sumerians. Sumerians already had 20 different varieties of beer. And the basic principle of beer making has not much changed over, uh, over those 10,000 of years. You always had to take a grain, you had to um, turn it into malt and then turn the malt into beer. So there was always the necessity to dry the, uh, the grain at some point in the process. And um, in uh, Zumeria and in, in those warm countries, the kilning, the drying process was done by uh, the sun. They were just spreading out the grain um, on their uh, flat rooftops. Like when you travel those countries today and you look at traditional houses, they always have flat roofs where they kiln on, and dry all kinds of things, fruits, dates, uh, grain. Here in Germany, there's um, an excavation site from about 2,500 uh, 2, years ago, so 500 uh, BC. Uh, it's called the Hochdorfer Dargraben. And in that one, they actually found barley malt, um, which had a smoky uh, flavor to it, and it's roasted from the outside. So it's uh, definitely proven that our ancestors were all making beer that had a, a smoky aroma and, uh, and flavor because there was no other technology available. It was the only way how uh, they could do um, a malt. And only here in Bamberg, the old technology survived. Um, Bamberg had around 70 breweries at the time, around 1800, all of them only made smoked beer. By about 1850, um, uh, half of the breweries had switched to the new technology and did not make smoked beer anymore. And around 1900, only four breweries were left to do the traditional smoke, smoke beer and the, uh, the, uh, had their smoke kiln still in operation. Um, that was the, um, the Spezial Brewery. They're still around today. They still do that. The Schlenkerle Brewery, we're still around. We, we still do it the old way. Then there was the brewery Polar Bear. They closed in World War II. And there was the brewery Greifenthal. Um, they stopped their malting operation in the second half of the 20th century. They still exist as a brewery, but they don't do their own malt anymore and they don't do a smoke malt for, for that reason. So Schlenkerle and Spezial um, are the only breweries in Germany and worldwide that continued the old tradition until today. And so we're uh, the only ones that still have those old smoke kilns in operation um, as they used to be. And um, because of that, nowadays, uh, our two breweries are uh, members of the Arc of Taste from Slow Food, that organization that uh, was founded in Italy and uh, has as a goal to preserve all food specialties, which might otherwise get extinct by modern technology. And nowadays, of course, there's uh, more smoked beer on the market than just Schlenkerle and, and Spezial. Um, with the craft beer revolution that started in the United States some 20 years ago, um, maltsters jumped on, on the occasion or on the opportunity and started to produce smoke malt again for those craft breweries. At the beginning, I remember that some of the craft breweries were contacting us and wanted to buy our smoke malt, but uh, we don't have the means to produce more than what we need for ourselves. So we never sold any smoke malt to, to any other third party. And so where there's a demand, somebody will fill that gap, obviously. So I, I should mention, we're on the West Coast, and we have a, are able to, to get your beer in stores here. So I want to encourage everybody that uh, might be interested in, in the Schlenkola Rausch beer, you can get it in the United States. Maybe not in every city, but uh, pretty widely distributed. The bigger ones should have it. And our importer, I think they sell in 40 something states and California, definitely. Uh, Washington, the big cities, they have that. Yeah. And Could I think that's also Describe that's for our viewers that, that first smell, that first aroma of, the, of this. So when, when, when you first uh, dump your nose in, in, into the beer, it's, it's, it's just smokiness. It's, uh, Smoke, smoke, smoke everywhere, like smoked ham or, or bacon. And um, the, the thing is when, when you drink, when you drink your first Schlenkela, um, you will notice 
um, almost only smoke. And I think, cheers, we, we start with that one. And the color, it's a relatively dark beer. It's about 55 um, color units. Um, the hoppiness is relatively strong as well. The hoppiness is similar to a Pilsner style beer, but because it has such a rich malt and uh, the strong smoke character, um, you won't uh, uh, experience it like, like a Pilsner beer because the, the hoppiness is not as dominant. And there's an old saying in, in Bamberg that you have to drink three pints of Schlenkeler to fully acquire the smoked beer flavor. Um, now, this is not just a line for us to sell more beer. Um, I mean, if, if it happens that way, we're okay with it, obviously. But um, there's actually some, some uh, organoleptic background to it. Um, when we taste things on our palate, um, our, our tongue can only perceive five different flavors. Um, uh, hot, spicy, salty, sour, bitter, and umami. All the other flavors we perceive, we perceive with our nose. So basically what happens when you eat something, when you drink something, um, the flavor elements or some flavor elements become airborne in your mouth and then go into your nose. And also, you, of course, you smell it when you drink it, when you eat. And the overall aroma impression your brain receives comes to a large extent actually from your nose. Um, you can recognize that very quickly. Whenever you eat something, when you have a cold, when, when, uh, when your nose is closed, um, the flavor is really dull and a lot of flavors are, are missing. So the same happens, of course, with smoke. Smoke is airborne. And um, you might have noticed when, when you come into a room and there's a certain smell, that relatively quickly that smell goes away. Um, this is not because the smell is not in the room anymore. This is because your nose adapts to it and, and kind of blends it out or the receptors in your nose are full with that aroma. And then you can notice different aromas. So that's what actually what happens when you drink Schlenkeler. The, the first point, it's all about smokiness. Um, it's, you perceive the smoke and the smoke is so dominant that all the other flavor components have a hard time getting to your brain. When you drink your second Schlenkeler, you have um, the first adaption to the smoky aroma and then the malt character, the, the rich malt flavor, the full mouthfeel, all that uh, comes out into the beer. And by the third pint, you won't notice the smoke that much anymore. By the third pint, then you have the full aroma complexity of, of the Schlenkeler beer. So um, it's, it's really about getting used to the smokiness in order to dig through to all the other aromas in the beer. And for us people in Bamberg, uh, when at say age 18, when we're allowed to drink beer, um, when we start with our first smoked beers, um, that's a, 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 a certain thing we, we, we have to learn. But once you're in there, um, even the first Schlenkeler has that full complexity and flavor. And we had the, uh, the Helles Lager before. When you're used to the classic Schlenkeler smoke beer, and then you go back to the Helles Lager, you won't notice the smokiness in the Helles Lager anymore. And it's just a crispy uh, uh, lager beer. So most Bamberg people's, uh, people would not consider the lager a smoke beer. This one, that's just the classic. Cheers. Cheers. Well, Matthias, I want to thank you very much for joining us today to talk about Schlenkerle, your Rausch beer, and Bomberg. We really appreciate it and participating in Webtoberfest. Uh, we're doing our best to, to make it a, a good thing online this year, virtually, but we certainly look forward to the day when we can be in person having three pints of Schlenkerle, Rausch beer, and getting, getting uh, good company in Bomberg. We will look forward to your visit and uh, I'm pretty sure that next year when the vaccine is around, everything is going to be back to normal and then everybody is going to sit uh, back together in the tavern and you have that uh, Franconian Gemütlichkeit and uh, in, enjoy Schlenkela. Um, yes, I would, I would encourage anybody watching this to, if they are going to travel to Germany after all this is over, to make sure and book a trip into Bamberg and visit. We welcome you here. Look forward to your visit, enjoy. And the last thing you need to remember, 
when you drink a Schlenkeler in the Schlenkeler Tavern in Bamberg, it actually comes from the wooden barrel. So it's all genuine, all original, and it's a time travel of beer. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you very much, Matthias.